Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody from all over the world. I'm Xiaowen Zeng, the coordinator of current series, Air Pollution and Human Health Web of the Family Series. And I would like to welcome all of you to join our lecture. And last week, we have lecture on health impact of China's air pollution prevention and control action plan from Professor Guo Xinli. And today we are going to have the eighth lecture, air pollution and cardio, uh, respiratory diseases and cancer. Before starting the lecture, I would like to give a short introduction of our honor speaker, Dr. Caroline Lodge, who is a um, senior research fellow at the Allergy and Lung Health Unit Center for Epidemiology and Biostatistics at University of Melbourne. Dr. Lodge got her PhD degree in the major of epidemiology and biostatistics from the University of Melbourne. Um, and actually, she has years of expertise in both medicine and epidemiology. Dr. Lodge's main research in interests include asthma, allergic diseases, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, and lung health in longitudinal cohort. Um, okay, let's welcome today's speaker, Dr. Caroline Lodge. And I'm going, going to hand it over to you and stop my sharing. Okay. There we go. Thank you, Xiaowen. If I can find my, there we are. Let's share that. And can you see my slideshow? Right, right, I can see your slides. See my slides? Uh-huh. Ah, are we good now? Yes. Okay. Very good. Um, okay, thank you. As uh, Xiaowen said, uh, my name is Caroline Lodge and thank you for inviting me to uh, speak about this topic, air pollution and its relationship with cardiorespiratory disease and cancer. Um, as Joanne said, I work at the University of Melbourne, the Allergy and Lung Health Unit here, and uh, I'm principally a, an epidemiologist. I just wanted to give you an outline of what I was going to be talking about today. I'm going to talk briefly about non-communicable diseases, then I'm going to talk about air pollution, and then air pollution as it relates to non-communicable diseases, look at a bit at the body of literature around air pollution, and give... Um, a review of a, a few studies in this area, and then some other considerations and a summary. So firstly, uh, non-communicable diseases. Over the 20th century, we've seen a huge rise in the prevalence of non-communicable diseases, um, largely because we understand infection and we're treating infectious diseases, but also because the general health of the population is increasing and people are getting older. And uh, the opportunity for these diseases with very long uh, latent periods and, and development times is increasing. So much so that uh, WHO uh, says that 73% of all deaths annually globally are from non-communicable diseases. And that equates to 41 million people. And of these, the three diseases I'm talking about tonight, cardiovascular disease, cancer, or, or this morning for the rest of you, cardiovascular diseases, cancer, and respiratory diseases are the top three non-communicable diseases. And they're responsible for the bulk of mortality from NCDs worldwide for 31 million people, cardiovascular diseases for 18 million people, cancer for 9 million people, and respiratory diseases for 4 million people. So what do I exactly mean when I'm talking about these diseases? So for cardiovascular disease, I principally mean the big two players, ischemic heart disease and stroke. For respiratory diseases, um, I'm talking principally about uh, the chronic obstructive lung diseases, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and asthma, and also um, lower respiratory tract infections like pneumonia. And for cancer in this space with air pollution, I'm principally talking mostly about lung cancer, but air pollution has been linked with many other cancers, including breast, bladder, gastric, colorectal, kidney, and childhood leukemias and astrocytoma. 
So we know that NCDs have a great burden of disease, but how much of this is attributable to air pollution exposure? Well, the WHO thinks that air pollution is associated with almost a quarter of all the deaths from uh, cardiovascular disease, respiratory diseases and cancer, which uh, equates to 7 million people globally annually. And as you can see from this WHO graphic, 21% um, of those are due to pneumonia, 20% from stroke, 34% from ischemic heart disease, 19% from COPD, and 7% from lung cancer. So in numbers, that equates to 1.5 million dying annually from air pollution-related pneumonia, 1.4 million from stroke related to air pollution, um, 2.4 million annually from ischemic heart disease related to air pollution, COPD 1.3 million, and lung cancer half a million. It's a huge number of deaths. Um, you may have noticed in uh, the previous graphic that they were talking about all sources of air pollution. Generally, we think of air pollution as outdoor, but in fact, there are two very distinct um, air pollution environments that we exist in, ambient or outdoor air pollution and household or indoor air pollution. So for uh, outdoor air pollution, um, again, another graphic from the WHO, the main players in this area are transport, traffic-related air pollution um, and uh, the pollution generated uh, through providing energy and with industry. Um, but there's also pollution from waste management, um, from dusts, agricultural practices and a spillover from um, heating practices in households which emits air pollution into the environment. In terms of indoor air pollution, the players are a little bit different. We do have the influence of outdoor air pollution um, that permeates into the house, um, but indoor air pollution is dominated by um, the pollution related to use, uh, uh, to energy and, and cooking and heating choices, and principally for low and middle income countries that equates to using biomass fuels. And in higher income countries, the important exposure is indoor cigarette smoke. In the indoor uh, model, you can also see that there are many other exposures related to building materials or furnitures, also related um, to activities within the house um, and uh, to the presence of animals, uh, moulds and bacteria. Just uh, interestingly, to think about our exposure to air pollution over our lifetimes, um, it depends on how much time we spend indoors versus outdoors. Uh, the US Environmental Protection Authority estimates that on average, Americans spend 93% of their lives indoors. 87% of that is spent in buildings, work and home, and 6% in vehicles. Um, only 7% of life is spent outdoors. So although when we think about air pollution and, and a lot of the air pollution literature has focused on ambient or outdoor air pollution, um, it may be that indoor air pollution uh, may be more important uh, for many of the long-term outcomes. In terms of pollutants for outdoor air, um, the ones that we're really interested in and that the WHO has, has uh, issued guidelines for are these four. Um, particulate matter, ozone, nitrogen dioxide and sulphur dioxide. Particulate matter, um, I'm just going to say a little bit more about. Um, so as you know, these are very small particles that are inhalable and respirable. They're made of um, carbon black, along with water, ammonia, nitrates, sulphates, salts. Um, and they may contain metals or other poisons. Um, depending on where they were produced. Now, the important things about these particles is that they're respirable. And as you know, we grade them according to their size, their, their diameter. And we have PM10s, smaller than 10 microns, um, PM2.5, and, and then ultrafine particles. The size of the particle depends where the particle deposits in your respiratory tract. So the PM10 particles, smaller than 10, uh, deposit in the upper respiratory tract and nasopharynx. Um, the particles that are sized between 5 and 10 microns find their way a little bit further down um, the, uh, the respiratory tract into the bronchioles and trachea. 
particles that are even smaller than that, one to five microns, um, they are the worrying ones and the ones for which we have the most evidence of long-term effects. These ones go right into the terminal bronchioles and into the alve alveoli and are small enough to get into the bloodstream and the lung tissue. And that's why it's thought that these particles can have effects other than, other than on the lung because they actually get into the body. In terms of indoor uh, pollutants um, that have guidelines for levels by the WHO, there's a huge list and most of them are related to building materials or, or other activities within houses. Um, of this list, uh, the ones that are now turning orange are thought to be related to increased risk of cancer. Um, the ones that have stayed black are thought to be related to uh, uh, respiratory and cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. Now, in terms of the disease burden um, for outdoor or indoor pollution separately, um, of the 7 million deaths per year by all pollution, 4.2 million are thought to be direct, directly related to exposure to ambient or outdoor pollution. And these deaths are the ones that we're interested in, stroke, heart disease, lung cancer, and chronic respiratory diseases. And it's known that 91% of the population lives in areas which exceed um, the WHO quality guidelines for outdoor air. Um, or saying it in another way, nine out of 10 people breathe air containing high levels of pollutants. But the people that breathe this air are not equally distributed across the earth. So um, more people are exposed in this area, in the Southeast Asia region, in the Western Pacific region, in Africa and the Eastern Mediterranean. They're disproportionately exposed um, compared to other populations to high levels of air pollution. Well, what do we mean by high levels? So WHO, the World Health Organization, um, has set a guideline for coarse particulate matter, PM10, of 20 micrograms per metre squared as an annual mean. Um, but our latest uh, information on, on the annual means of particulate matter by the regions, the WHO region, shows that, in fact, all of them are exceeding this annual guideline mean and some of them are exceeding it by up to eight times. Again, you can see the inequitable exposure to PM10 across region. And how about PM2.5? Um, well, this is an interactive, interactive map um, from the World Health Organization looking at um, fine particulate matter or PM2.5. And again, the recommended guideline for an annual mean is 10 micrograms per metre cubed. But as you can see from this key up in the corner where levels exceeding 10 are yellow, orange or red, that again, the same countries are affected or regions are affected by this increased exposure to PM 2.5. So um, how about the burden from uh, household or indoor air pollution? 3.8 million deaths are annually attributed to household air pollution. And as I mentioned earlier, this is largely thought to be related um, to biomass used for cooking and heating. More than 3 billion people worldwide use pollution energy sources for cooking, and that's 40% of the world's population. Um, and it's thought related to this that 50% of pneumonia deaths in children under five are due to household air pollution. In higher income countries, tobacco smoke um, is the major source of indoor pollution. Okay, so we've been uh, fairly uh, positive about a link between air pollution and these non-communicable disease deaths um, between outdoor and indoor air pollution. So what is the body of evidence supporting this link? Um, I did a quick search in PubMed database to have a look at articles uh, investigating the association between air pollution exposure and cancer, um, respiratory disease or cardiovascular disease outcome. And as you can see, um, there's a huge um, body of evidence 
um, starting in the 1950s, uh, continuing to this day, and almost an exponential increase in studies. Um, and over the last few years, there have been over 800 studies per year looking at just this link. In terms of um, more solid evidence, however, we tend to look at um, systematic reviews of uh, original studies. And if you limit this search to systematic reviews, you also see an increase in the amount of evidence out there, um, starting much later when we started to do systematic reviews. Um, and now we're getting 30 to 40 systematic reviews per year um, in this space. So what are these studies like? What are their designs? Where can we get the best evidence from? Um, so air pollution is an, a nasty toxic exposure. We all know that. So many of these studies can't be randomised controlled trials because it's not ethical to randomise people to air pollution exposure, especially for, long, for the long term to investigate things like cancer and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So long-term outcomes um, need to be investigated using observational studies and ideally well-conducted prospective cohort studies um, on a variety of populations with frequent and accurate measurement of exposure and confounding variables over the lifespan and accurate outcome measurement. And even better than that is uh, systematic reviews of prospective cohort studies with meta-analyses. So these would provide the best evidence on uh, uh, long-term outcomes like lung cancer and COPD. In terms of short-term outcomes, we have a little bit more latitude. Again, um, largely observational studies, short-term cohorts, ecological studies, case control studies. But there's also possible, uh, a possibility for limited um, RCTs to be done in this space. What other considerations of the literature um, in uh, this association. So there are many other uh, considerations that we have to think about. Uh, morbidity versus mortality. So the, the statistics I showed you up front about the burden of disease were all based on morbidity from these diseases. But that's really just the tip of the iceberg. There's uh, an awful lot of literature just looking at disease rather than death. Um, so studies choose to look at one or the other. Um, short or long-term effects. Many studies just look at the short-term effect. For example, high air pollution days and admission um, to hospital with asthma, while other studies are assessing long-term effects, um, like the development of, of asthma um, from air pollution. Again, causation versus persistence or exacerbation. Some studies are looking in populations without disease to see whether exposure causes disease over time, whereas others are looking at populations with disease and whether air pollution exacerbates or, or causes disease persistence. There are also a lot of new studies, newer studies on modification of, of the exo exposure between air pollution and these non-communicable diseases by region, income and individual genetic factors where there's a lot more literature now and also on pollu pollution types, especially pollution uh, from PM 2.5, which is not uniform across countries. It contains different things and may have different risks. So now I just wanted to look um, uh, briefly at a few recent examples of the relationship between household and ambient air pollution and uh, cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease and cancer. Um, and firstly, I wanted to look at uh, long-term household air pollution exposure. And as I said earlier, the best evidence in this space is to be gained from uh, systematic reviews and meta-analyses of observational studies um, with care carefully characterised exposure and outcome measurements. Um, and the first one I'm going to look at in this in this one, I'm going to look at both uh, biomass fuel and uh, secondhand smoke because those are the two perhaps most important, arguably the two most important exposures um, for indoor air pollution. So this is a systematic review and a meta-analysis um, done on the back of the Global Burden of Disease 2010 study, um, looking at household use of biomass 
and lung cancer. Um, they did a very comprehensive search of the literature involving 10 databases and they accepted any biomass fuel for cooking or heating, which included wood, straw, grass, grass crop waste or residue, animal dung or charcoal. Um, and as with many uh, observational studies on large numbers of people over long times, it's almost impossible to find any with any direct pollution measurements. They all use proxy measurements. Um, did you use biomass fuel? Which one was it? Rather than any direct air measurements. So there's the potential for some exposure misclassification. Um, they used pathologically confirmed lung cancer, lung, uh, cancer of the lung trachea or bronchus. Um, they, very, uh, they did a, a bias assessment tool. They employed random effects meta-analysis. After searching these 10 databases, they only found, found 13 studies and they were all case control studies. And again, this is not unusual um, to have case control studies where the outcome is rare. So lung cancer being a relatively uh, rare outcome um, is often investigated by case control studies. So the numbers required in a prospective cohort would be extraordinarily large to get enough cases to do the analysis. The majority of these studies uh, were in Asia, um, but there was one in Mexico and one with three sites in Europe, USA and Canada. And uh, they uh, looked at a total of uh, just over 8,000 cases and 11,000 controls. Now we're just going to look at uh, the forest plot for the meta-analysis, but you won't be able to see it, so don't worry about it. Just wanted to um, represent it visually. They've broken it up by men and women, and then uh, uh, done the quantitative analysis down the bottom. Um, and what they've shown when they put all of these studies together with not that much heterogeneity, they're fairly similar, is a 17% increase in the risk of lung cancer um, if you are exposed to biomass fuels. So they have definitely shown this. Um, however, it's only a small number of studies, but a large number of cases. They did realise, however, that um, some of the studies were not terribly good with their uh, comparison group classification. So they asked if people were exposed to certain biomass fuels. Um, however, the comparison group was not clear. So the comparison group may also have been exposed to a different biomass fuel. So they did a sensitivity analysis restricting to the five good studies, which had um, uh, adjusted for relevant confounders and also um, had a clean fuel group for comparison in the hope that they would um, get a more accurate uh, measurement of the association. And in this one, they actually found a 95% increase in odds of lung cancer with the use of biomass fuels. So uh, just, uh, it's a good way in your systematic review to actually try and uh, do sensitivity analysis to question the results and get the best uh, unbiased association. The other one I'm looking at for long-term exposures is secondhand smoke and lung cancer in a Japanese population. This is also a, a systematic review and meta-analysis of uh, observational studies on studies in Japan. Uh, and they uh, registered, they did a lot of things right for a systematic review. They registered on Prospero, um, they only looked at two databases. Um, the people that they were studying were lifetime non-smokers who had been exposed or not exposed to secondhand smoke. Um, the exposure status, again, um, was not terribly objective. It was a question on whether a member of your household um, smokes. So there was, again, no objective measurement of air quality or air pollution status. Um, they found nine studies that fit their uh, inclusion criteria, four were cohort and five were case control. And the outcomes were, were objective. They were lung cancer incidence or mortality, um, verified by death certificates or cancer registries. They had a good risk of bias assessment, but again, um, unexposed groups differed. The numbers in this study were also very large, um, as is 
a case for observational studies um, with 100,000, with 1,000 lung cancers and, and 600,000 person years um, or 2,500 controls, depending on whether we were looking at the case controls or the cohorts. So here's the meta-analysis of the relationship between exposure to secondhand smoke, someone smoking in your house, and the risk of lung cancer in Japan. And they found a very impressive 28% increase in the relative risk of lung cancer in long-term in never smokers from being exposed to household smoke. Okay, so um, the third study uh, that I wanted to talk about um, was one of short-term exposures. So we're going from the long-term exposures to the short-term exposures and uh, uh, looking at outside air pollution rather than indoor air pollution. And having said that RCTs are unethical in this space, I'm reviewing an RCT, um, and uh, uh, which is obviously not ethical because it got through. Um, and it's also very impressive for being in The Lancet and having the longest title I've ever seen. Uh, respiratory and cardiovascular responses to walking down a traffic polluted road compared with walking in a traffic free area in participants aged 60 years and older with chronic lung or heart disease and age matched healthy controls, a randomised crossover study. So what did they do in this study? Um, this is a very interesting study. As, as mentioned, it's a randomised crossover study. They enrolled men and women who were 60 years or over. Into, there were three different groups, those with angiographically proven stable ischemic heart disease, 39 participants, those with gold 2 COPD, 40 participants and 40 healthy volunteers. All of these uh, 120 odd people had been non-smokers for the last 12 months and they were randomly assigned to walk for two hours um, along either a commercial street in London, Oxford Street, or through the green and leafy Hyde Park. And then uh, three to eight weeks later, they were assigned to walk through the other location. They did baseline measurements um, for cardiovascular and respiratory markers, and they put on personal um, air pollution monitors, um, monitoring the concentrations of carbon black, particulate matter, ultrafine particles, um, nitrogen dioxide during the walk. So as you've noticed from this study, it has uh, much smaller numbers, um, uh, but it is far more uh, expensive in terms of the monitoring and uh, 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 the setup of the study. Um, but they're getting good characterization of exposure and outcome. So um, in terms of what the people were exposed to, um, this is uh, a figure representing um, uh, exposure to Hyde Park in blue, that's the green leafy walk, and Oxford Street in, in red, that's the high traffic with lots of diesel exposure. Um, for various uh, air pollution parameters, black carbon, nitrogen dioxide, noise, ultrafine particles, PM 2.5, PM 10, they've also put in temperature and humidity. And what you can see from these graphs is that those who were, walked in the, the heavily, uh, heavy traffic area were exposed to way more black carbon, nitrogen dioxide, and all of the particulate matter than those that were, walked in Hyde Park. So we've got very objective exposure classification, but what did they find with the outcomes? So in terms of symptoms, um, this figure shows uh, the odds of cough, sputum, shortness of breath, wheeze and sweat um, for participants with COPD, ischemic heart disease or healthy participants. And the red dotted line is the no effect line. The um, red estimates um, show a significant difference and the blue estimates uh, also just on the borderline of a significant difference and the black estimates are not significantly different. And if you look at uh, this figure, you'll see that um, the COPD patients are the ones that had the most symptoms after their walking. Um, 
and that they had increased symptoms, two times the odds of cough, three times the odds of sputum, um, almost two times the odds of shortness of breath and four times the odds of wheeze when they were walking through the polluted environment compared to the Hyde Park environment. Um, but you're going to say to me that's a very subjective outcome. They knew they were walking through a park or a high traffic environment and the symptoms could be subjective. Well, the beauty of this study is they did all sorts of objective measurement of biomarkers as well. And to look at respiratory um, measurements, they did spirometry. And this figure shows um, uh, two spirometry parameters. Um, the change in forced expiratory volume in one second for these three up here, and the change in um, forced vital capacity for these three down here. And they are divided for the healthy volunteers, those with COPD and those with ischemic heart disease. The red represents um, walking on Oxford Street and the, high, uh, the blue represents walking on Hyde Park. And without looking in detail, what you can see from all of these graphs, sorry, I just wanted to talk about the, the time axis as well. This is where they started walking. This is two hours when they finished walking. And this is up to 26 hours after the walking started. But what you can see from all of these six graphs is that the blue line, the walking through Hyde Park, appears to have beneficial effects for lung function in terms of FEV1 and FVC um, for all um, participants um, in, in regardless of whether or not they had ischemic heart disease um, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or whether they were healthy participants. So at the two hour mark, you seem to have improvements of uh, lung function parameters and they maintain out until um, the 26 hour mark. And they're almost always different from those walking in the uh, highly polluted areas. So what did they find in terms of cardiovascular outcomes? This is just one of the cardiovascular measures um, that they used. This is a measure of arterial stiffness um, change in pulse wave velocity. And for this one, ideally, um, you want the stiffness to decrease, that's healthier. So uh, again, we have the three different groups, the healthy people, the people with COPD, and the people with ischemic heart disease. And we have um, over time, the two hour mark and up to 26 hours after um, the walk. And again, what we see for the people who walked through, well, for when the people walked through Hyde Park, there was a reduction in arterial stiffness um, with a decrease in change in pulse wave velocity across all three groups and uh, a paradoxical increase across the other groups. So although these are not actual disease outcomes, they're very um, interesting uh, markers of uh, cardiovascular and respiratory disease and may point to the mechanisms behind um, how air pollution may cause some of the cardiovascular and respiratory outcomes. So what did they conclude? They concluded that um, in all participants, walking in Hyde Park led to an increase in respiratory function in terms of FEV1 and FVC and improved cardiopulmonary measurements and that these were maintained up to 26 hours after the walk. In COPD patients, um, they found that exposure to increased amount of PM2.5 and NO2 and ultrafine particles attenuated or reversed these responses. They also concluded that short-term exposure to traffic-related air pollution prevents the beneficial cardiopulmonary effects of walking for people with COPD, ischemic heart disease, and also in healthy people without chronic cardiopulmonary disease. And uh, they made the recommendation that walking should be enjoyed um, in urban green space areas away from high density traffic. So this, although this study can't tell us about causation in, in terms of um, exposure in the short term causing a long term disease, what it does is it, it provides evidence um, that short term intermediate parameters of cardiovascular and respiratory function um, are affected even by very short term exposures to air pollution. And it provides clues to mechanisms of how um, these associations between air pollution and cardiovascular and respiratory disease may be mediated. 
So uh, what else? In terms of um, other issues, future directions, um, well, a lot of uh, uh, the literature now is looking at um, differences in uh, the, the relationships between uh, air pollution exposure and uh, these outcomes based on levels of air pollution, types and composition of air pollution, other um, concomitant environmental factors, um, socioeconomic status, and particularly genetics. There's a lot of um, information now and studies looking at uh, risk alleles for particular genes and whether or not it modifies the relationship between air pollution and these diseases. Um, the other area that needs more investigation at the moment is in mechanisms, how these things happen. Um, by finding out more about those sorts of things, we can possibly try to interrupt these mechanisms and prevent these diseases. Um, a further focus for this research is looking for approaches for reductions of harms. And uh, one of the other things that would actually uh, make this research more accurate and uh, be able to characterise risks much better is, is a way to measure uh, personal exposure um, very accurately, even for longer term studies. Um, we also need to know a little bit more about a particulate matter and their constituents and how the individual constituents affect um, uh, the relationships. So in terms of solutions for these exposures, um, the World Health Organization um, is uh, making policies and investments supporting cleaner transport, energy efficient housing uh, and power generation, um, and energy efficiency in industry and better municipal waste management. Um, so that's the sort of things that they're up to. And in terms of household air pollutions, there are attacking the biomass problem with a clean household energy solutions toolkit, where they're going into communities, assessing the need and changing um, the uh, fuel used for cooking and heating. So uh, in summary, there's a very large body of evidence indicating that there is a, a robust relationship between air pollution exposure, both ambient and uh, indoor air pollution exposure, and the three biggest um, contributors to mortality from the non-communicable diseases, um, respiratory diseases, cardiovascular diseases, and cancer. Um, in fact, the WHO says that seven million deaths annually um, are related uh, to, to um, air pollution exposure for these diseases, and that ambient air pollution may be responsible for 4.2 million and household air pollution for 3.8. Um, low and middle income countries are disproportionately affected. Uh, the main issues for outdoor air pollution are traffic related air pollution and energy generation. And the main issues for indoor um, air pollution are biomass fuels and cigarette smoke, secondhand smoking. Um, there needs to be global approaches to limit and modify these exposures, and there needs to be further investigation on individual susceptibilities, accurate measurement of pollution exposure, and compositions of air pollutants. And that's all I have for you. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks for Caroline's wonderful talk. <laughs> now we are opening for questions. Um, you can type the questions on the chat box on the one down of the Zoom panel, or you can speak directly to the speaker if you have a microphone. I'm just trying to find the text box. Right. Um, on the see it at the right down. Can, can you see that on the down? Of Let's have a look. There's the chat box. Yeah. Yeah. So when to, when you are sharing your screen, actually the, the panel is going moving to the upper part of your screen. And if you see the, yeah, it's uh, just tricky. Oh. And so the, on, on the right side, you see the last one with, uh, with three dots. You click there and the first one that appears should be chat. Yeah, so I've got the Zoom group chat up now. Um, and uh, so there's, there's one question uh, relating to access to today's slides. Um, yes, that's fine. I think that's probably for you, who are more than me. Um, <laughs> 
Um, and there's another one about air pollution in relation to menstrual cycle and reproductive outcomes. Um, I actually uh, haven't had a close look at that area, but I, I think it probably is related. I'm not sure if that's a subject of an upcoming talk. Is that right, shall we? Well, actually, uh, for the question from Tara, yeah, uh, the recent, you know, if you do the literature review, we can find that recent studies have found that the uh, association between air pollution and the uh, menstrual cycles because, um, as we know, that the many chemicals on the particle matter, they some of them they have the external effect and some of them are like the engine effect. So the actually the, the association is kind of a mixed, but we do find some association between them. But we need to do more literature to build toward this question. But uh, actually, yes, mm, they yeah, they have. It doesn't doesn't surprise me because of uh, the. Um, the chemicals, the uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals attached to a lot of the particulate matter. Um, there's another question about the typical age group studied in cohort studies. Um, it can be any age group. So uh, studies in this space, particularly looking at, at asthma, is often studied in a younger age group. And cohorts are often prospective cohorts from birth, birth cohort studies. Um, but looking at uh, COPD, um, or ischemic heart disease, which are diseases of older age, um, they're often studied uh, after the age of 50 or 60 when those diseases start to come on. So they might be studied from the age of 40 up to the age of 80 um, when you get the maximum um, incidence of those uh, conditions. Well, actually, um, can I just share the interesting paper on the lancer. You know, we, we all know that the exercise and the physical activity are good for you know, human health. But in that study, we can find that uh, the, it's a, actually it's a well-designed ethnology study. Even though they just have the, not a large number of the participants, the sample size, but they, they did have the interesting result. And um, well, I give you the um, suggestion that that when you do the access to when you um, walk up and you prefer you should prefer the the place with the more the greenness and other than the you know the, the main row and the chapel row. Yeah, no, that's very true. So uh, a lot of uh, uh, COPD and uh, ischemic heart disease rehab programs focus on on the health effects, health benefits from walking. Um, but this study shows that if you exercise, even um, mild exercise in, in a polluted area, that the, the health benefits may not be there and may even be the reverse. It may be a detriment. Um, yeah, so that's a very difficult question. Uh, what could be the exposure outcome health effect in case of cardiovascular disease, asthma or lung disease? for a crossover observational study for indoor biofuels use. Uh, yeah, so um, I think that um, for that one, because biofuels are, are it's gonna be one that's, that's very difficult ethically um, because we know that exposure to biofuels is bad. Um, so it, it may be that uh, you could look at um, equivalent biofuels in a way. So uh, choices that are, are present in the community so that you're not sort of ethically uh, uh, changing exposure in, in a way, but you could look at um, one biofuel compared to an, another. Or I think what has been done in the literature and what I've seen is actually um, uh, cluster randomizing certain groups to have replacement of biofuels um, with uh, clean energy and comparing them to similar communities that keep using their same biofuels. In that way, you, you uh, do an RCT, but it's cluster randomized. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions from the audience? Well, if not, um, thanks, Carol, again for your wonderful presentation. <laughs> and I would like to remind all of you the next coming lecture will be air pollution and central nervous system. Cistern diseases from Professor Kajan Kenyon.
and thanks for coming on again. And I will see you guys next Wednesday. Bye. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Thank you.